Uh, hello, Blogging Heads viewers. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Rob Farley from Patterson School of Diplomacy and International Commerce at the University of Kentucky. And with me today, once again, uh, is Steve Seidemann. I think this is your third appearance on Blogging Heads, your third appearance on so. Blogging Entanglements. Your last one was curtailed. We had uh, uh, a situation where we were talking about Tom Clancy and the, the screen froze. and It was really very unClancy-esque, right? The, the technology is all supposed to work in Tom Clancy discussions, and in, in this case it just didn't. Maybe it was Soviet technology. Um, so anyway, uh, why don't you, can you remind people who you are? Sure, uh, I'm the Patterson Chair at the other Patterson School, the one that's at Carleton University in Ottawa, Canada. Um, that's my title. Mm -hmm. Now, so you, you and I have been, uh, I wouldn't say competitive, uh, because I don't think we're really competing for the same precious book buying dollar, but although it's actually pretty close, but um, we have been competitive in terms of obnoxious book promotion over the past month and a half. Uh, <laughs> yes, I, I think uh, uh, I think uh, you've inspired me. Some other folks have inspired me. Peter Singer's got a book that came out roughly at the same time, and he had a song list attached to you know his web page, and inspired me to create a song list to attach to my web page. That's actually a really good idea. How do you do that? Is you, do you just do you just is that just a, a file, or do you just come up with songs that you like that you think the book? You know, I was lazy, so I mostly went through my iTunes, you know, list of songs and said, you know, what's, you know, look at each song and think, how does this fit? And, you know, each chapter had a few different themes. And so, it, mm -hmm. you know, I, if I was, uh, and, you, and then what you do is you go out onto, you know, YouTube and find videos of those songs. So it's very, mm -hmm. you know, it took longer than it should, but it didn't take that long. Um, but you've been very kind at retweeting most of my self-promotion and I've been, I didn't go to the extent that you did, which is create a separate Twitter account. Mm -hmm. uh, but now I get two tweets for everything I do because you, you, your <laughs> account does it, and then the grounded account does it. But uh, yeah, it's it's been fun, and uh, I have managed to uh, persuade a few folks to invite me out over the next couple months. Uh, mm -hmm. Starting this week with a trip to Kansas City mm -hmm. uh, to present my research uh, at the University of Missouri at Kansas City. Uh, so I also have a, a, a link to my book tour, uh, which is not funded at all by, by my editor, by, by publisher, but entirely by myself and the folks who are gracious enough to bring me out to interesting places. Yeah, no, my, my book tour is funded by, you know, my ability to drive to Cincinnati or Chicago or wherever else they'll have me. So, sure. um, so uh, I know we talked about this, but I think it got lost all of the, on the last blogging head. So can you, what's the book about? The book is trying to understand uh, how NATO works in wartime. Um, here, I'll even show you. Um, the basic idea is that when I, I had a fellowship in the Joint Staff in 2001, 2002, mm -hmm. I immediately developed lots of questions about NATO because I was working on the Bosnia desk, and the Bosnia desk was mostly focused on, on NATO, and most of the desks around me, whether that was the Serbia desk or the uh, Macedonia desk or East European countries, because they were all focused on um, NATO expansion at the time. Mm -hmm. And so I had lots of questions about how NATO worked in wartime. Uh, and uh, one of the ironies is that my first week in the Pentagon, a, a professor came over from the National War College to present us with NATO 101. Mm -hmm. And one of the first things he showed us was Article 5, which everybody knows is the part of the NATO treaty that says an attack upon one is equal to an attack upon all. And he pointed out there is that that is not the end of the phrase. That is not the end of the, the, the that article because it includes... When each, as each country deems necessary, which essentially means that every country can opt out of a, of a NATO mission. Right. Uh, and so after that year in the Pentagon, I had lots of questions about NATO, and I eventually finished my previous re research project and got into this one. And by the time that happened, Afghanistan was well underway. And so I, I worked with a friend of mine, Dave Arswald, who does teach at the National War College, to try to understand how does NATO work in wartime. And the answer really wasn't in Brussels. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't in Mons, which is the headquarter, the military headquarters of, of, of NATO. It was really the answer was in every separate capital, uh, whether that was Ottawa, Washington, Berlin, Paris, Copenhagen, The Hague, you name it. Uh, because what we realized is that no country surrenders control over the military, uh, even when it's in a multilateral uh, effort. In fact, especially when it's in a multilateral effort, because mm. for a lot of these countries, that's the only time their military does anything. Uh, so the, the book really became about trying to understand why there's so much variance. Why, the, why do countries vary so much in how they manage their troops and what the implications are for the, for the stuff on the ground? Uh, so it became more about comparative civil mill relations than it was really a book about I.O., about international relations. Although we, of course, went to Brussels anyway. Right, 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 because why not? Why not go to Brussels? So 
mean, it, it speaks to, you know, there's a pretty broad, and I think, I mean, this is obviously sort of well-known in the political science literature, but it's, I, I think it's also, there's, there's also a, a recognition that these, these conversations in the, the more policy popular literature is, you know, these questions of how coalitions function, right, and, and what it means to have a particular sort of coalition uh, in, when you are going and engaging war, and, you know, to the extent, and, and I don't think, you know, people necessarily put it in these terms, but they think they understand in these terms, right? To what extent do the aggregating effects of coalitions, to what extent are they offset by the friction of the alliance itself? Sure. Right. And what you concentrate here is really on the friction and, and what's generating the friction, and what's generating the friction here is mostly what's coming from the national capitals. That's right. Uh, the book is, uh, there are other books that sort of compare coalitions versus effectiveness. So Patty Weitzman and Sarah Kreps have different books out the past couple of years trying to understand why countries choose to coalesce mm -hmm. or to engage in alliance. Uh, our fundamental take on that question is really that um, coalitions of the willing have a lot of the same problems that NATO has. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just that they have other problems as well that tend to crowd this out, but coalitions of the willing vary very much in how willing countries are. Mm -hmm. So in, in, in Iraq, uh, the United States realized that some of the countries that joined the United States in Iraq had very, very tight restrictions of what they could and couldn't do on the ground. Mm -hmm. In Afghanistan, um, there was a lot of public debate about this, where you had the Rumsfeld and you had the Minister of Defense of Canada you know, go up to NATO meetings and complain about the restrictions on other troops. Because uh, to backtrack, uh, in the policy world, why this was really important is that uh, countries had a variety of ways to manage their troops, and one of them was these restrictions, these caveats, mm -hmm. which they would uh, inform the, some of the, they would some of the countries would inform other countries about some of their restrictions about what they could and could not do on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. And this read this was part of the reason why there was a very uneven distribution of the burden of the casualties in Afghanistan, because some countries refused to work in the south or the east, mm -hmm. which were more violent than the north and the west. Some countries refused to engage in offensive operations. Uh, there's a whole host of other restrictions, but those were sort of the two most important ones. Um, and our job was to try to figure out not just variations and caveats, because there's in the book we identify sort of four ways in which uh, countries engage in control uh, of the stuff on the ground, whether that's picking the commanders, which is a general. I don't know what. I think we have ghosts. Yeah, I, I don't know what they're doing outside my office right now. Oh, uh, they may be they may be cleaning the streets, which is very strange since I'm on the fourth floor. But okay. um, anyway, uh, go ahead. So there's four ways to control troops. Mm -hmm. uh, one is to pick the commanders. That was the American way of doing it because one of America's caveats is that whenever the United States is uh, involved enough, they usually insist on commanding the operation entirely. Right. And so the, the primary way the Americans controlled ISAF or their contribution to ISAF, their National Security Assistance Force, was to keep on changing who commanded ISAF. Uh, the second way is, is by shaping the discretion. Uh, so that was primarily seen in terms of caveats, these rules that say when you, what you could do, what you couldn't do, under what conditions we have to call home for permission. But it also meant you know, if you set a certain capability mix that automatically constrained your choices, whether that's the Germans sending six helicopters to their entire you know, one-fourth of Afghanistan, or the uh, uh, New Zealanders sending 200 guys. If you have to send 200 guys, you're not going to be asked to do a whole lot. Right. Um, uh, the third way is oversight. So how carefully do you pay attention to stuff on the ground? And that can vary quite widely. And the fourth is what are the incentives the commanders have? And so uh, one of the strangenesses that I've, I, I noticed in Canada was that every commander, in Af every Canadian commander who served in Afghanistan, with a couple of notable exceptions, was promoted, regardless of how much blood was shed and how much success was reached, mm -hmm. uh, which says that, that, you know, that you can engage in a, a pretty aggressive effort and not be punished later on. Right. And, 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 uh, the one exception in this case was somebody who was sort of vocally, uh, vocally, uh, um, uh, uh unhappy with the extent of Canada's war effort. Right. Um, well, one of them was a vocal, somebody who had already had his career tarnished before he sent over, was sent mm -hmm. over essentially. Another was a guy who got fired in the middle of the mission because he was sleeping with his board in it. Uh, such things happen. Um, yeah, so the questions, first I want to say that this is, you know, just a fantastic piece of research, um, that you guys have tons of interviews, tons of interesting interviews. You know, people were really, really willing to talk to you, although maybe that's um, something we could talk about in a bit, right? What What do you think they were not talking to you about? <laughs> like, what, 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 did you ever get a sense that there was sort of systematically something they weren't talking to you about? Um, but it's a fantastic piece of research. Um, Thank you. You know, so 
from my own particular interests, I guess one thing, and this goes to these these questions of oversight, the also the questions of um, picking agents, was um, sort of the concept of military professionalism and the concept of not strategic culture, which you guys talk about, but organizational culture, okay. um, which doesn't really appear to be there. I mean, the idea of organizational culture is that you line up two armies next to one another and they just fundamentally act. They aren't always going to act the same because they have different organizational cultures, whether this depends on conscription, some relationship with national culture, some sort of history. Um, you guys don't really plow into that, but you know, even sort of holding agent selection models and holding um, oversight constant, were there cases in which, you know, there really did appear to be different ways in, say, how the Danish military approached something versus how the New Zealand military approached something? Um, yes, I think so. I, I think the big issues that, I mean, we were looking at sort of things we could pick up and systematically compare across, mm, right. 16 different contingents. We talk about nine countries very closely and another seven countries a little bit less closely. Mm -hmm. um, and so were there things where countries behave differently? I mean, one of the striking things was when I was uh, at a briefing in Montreal. When I was living in Montreal, on a regular basis, uh, uh, somebody who was rotating out of command of the Canadian mission in Afghanistan or somebody who had been in, in the hierarchy mm -hmm. would come through and give their impressions of what they learned over the past six months of be hanging out in Kandahar. Because mm -hmm. uh, this is a systematic way that Canadians were trying to educate their opinion leaders, and so that was where the academics and the retired military guys always appear on TV. Mm -hmm. And even though this conversation was entire was this briefing was entirely in French, I was able to understand uh, this uh, lieutenant colonel's point when he was talking about the Americans in Kandahar. Because it used to be originally there were no American battalions in Kandahar, and then there was one because that was sort of the condition for the extension of the Canadian mission in 2008. Mm -hmm. And so for a while there, there was one Canadian battalion and then there was two. And then the Canadians realized something, which is not every American battalion is the same. Right. And so, that, so it became clear through, clear through this briefing that the Canadians were sort of puzzled at how the Americans could so vary in just what two different army, it wasn't even service. Right. It wasn't our Marines versus army, but it was two different army. That's battalions. interesting. That's interesting. And that's, that was a puzzle for the Canadians because they're such a small military um, that it's very hard for them to imagine having such wide variation. Although, you know, obviously there's different styles between the Quebec based regiment and the Albertan based regiment and so forth. Cause uh, it's very much regional in Canada, like it is in, in Britain. Um, <clears throat> but there was still a sense that the American military was so very, very big it, that there wasn't one organizational culture, but many. It has neighborhoods, right? Yeah. And and so the, the, and, you know, there, there were kind of, you know obviously there's differences between those units that had just spent a lot of time in Iraq versus those that had been in Afghanistan before. Right. Uh, so they had different ideas of what counterinsurgency is. Um, I'm sure there are different units that you know follow the playbook more religiously than others. Um, in terms of countries, yeah, they're, they're they're you know the the best example of this I have of organizational cultures of how sort of the TTPs as they put it tactics techniques and procedures that each country has that are slightly different was that when Britain was going into Bosnia, uh, Bosnia uh, as part of, I think it was part of S4, mm -hmm. uh, the Czechs or the, the Poles or the Bulgarians, I don't know which country it was, but some East European country that had formerly been part of the Warsaw Pact mm -hmm. was going in with them. And so they were sharing a conversation about how do you handle X, how do you handle Y. And so the British said, well, when somebody throws a Molotov cocktail, we take out the fire hoses and wash it all down and, and the, the East European country that actually wasn't named in this conversation mm -hmm. uh, said, well, when we see from Molotov cocktails, we take out our machine guns and we hose everyone all down. <laughs> and so, you know, that is sort of a cultural, organizational cultural thing about how they develop very different procedures. So that was a very, very distinct way. Mm -hmm. And the way countries by habit have managed that specific problem, how do you – Anticipate the organizational culture differences mm -hmm. as opposed to the big national culture ones or in combination with them is, is they try to work with those that they've worked with before. Um, so there are a lot of, there's a lot of debate in Canada about why Canada got in, went to Kandahar, which was one of the very toughest provinces in all of Afghanistan. And I think one of the reasons why was it meant going into the same region, that is a regional command south with the British, with the Dutch. Mm -hmm. Uh, and those were exactly the same partners they had in Bosnia. So they know what the British and the Dutch do. The, the Dutch were a very interesting case in the book. And I think the Canadians understood how the Dutch behaved because they, they experienced it before. Mm 
Um, so I think that's how countries manage that challenge of, of that, of, of learning both the larger national ways of behaving and the sort of intramilitary kind of dynamics. is a learning process over time. Nobody's going to be able to provide you with a complete um, code book of every country's peculiarities. Right, right, right. Our, our, this book <laughs> do the larger, larger patterns of behavior that are consistent over time. Right, and so, I mean, what, what's interesting about that with the, the sort of the response to differing military cultures um, is that it's very similar to the process you describe in how sort of, you know, different countries are evaluating each other's caveats, right? When, mm -hmm. when they're aware and when they're, when they're made as fully as aware as they can be of the capabilities and caveats of another force, is right, as they try to slot them in in something that they can do. Right, and you have to sort of describe the process, you know, by saying, "Well, this country's leaders will let them do this, and this ones will let them do this." And so, where do we put them so that they can, so that we have the sort of the least, pro, the fewest problems as possible? Um, and maybe I, I don't know how much people would talk to you about this, but I'm wondering how much people did. Were there ever? Did you ever see cases in which sort of the bonds of military professionalism? Or military um, you know, brotherhood between countries, especially between countries that had worked together for a long time, overcame or threatened to overcome national caveats, national oversights, national chain of command. Mm -hmm. Right? Were there ever these cases in which you know the British just knew uh, Americans, and so they were willing to do what uh, the Americans asked, even sort of if it meant stepping beyond what the British government in particular would mm -hmm. ask. Um, well, I, one of the things that was constantly emphasized, uh, when I was talking to the military guys is it often sounded like I was talking on Dr. Phil because mm -hmm. they'd be talking about relationships and trust and, you know, all those kinds of soft, uh, kind of things. Uh, and so it was very clear that in the course of the time in Afghanistan, if you knew, if there were, if, if there was trust, if there was a relationship between the commanders of different units that, they might interpret the restrictions more broadly and more loosely uh, um, than might otherwise be the case. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you would have a time where you know, two countries would be work working together very, very well because their two commanders knew each other and developed a relation of trust. And so they, you know, one country was able to engage in more cooperation than was supposed to take place. Um, and I'll get back to that in a second. Um, and then you'd have the commander you know, rotate out, a new commander would come in with a very, very different belief about how to follow those rules. And so then the cooperation would suffer. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and it also mattered, if, you know, if there was tight oversight, then it made it harder for leaders, you know, on the ground to be looser in how they interpreted things. So if there was looser oversight, then they could, they, they could more broadly understand what it means not to engage in offensive operations, for instance. Um, so there was a lot of variation on the ground about how these rules made up in national capitals. And, mm -hmm. and one of the best examples of this is when the Dutch decided to send their troops to Erzgan, which was neighbored uh, Kandahar, which is where the Canadians were serving. Um, their political process required a document to be produced that it didn't require a formal vote in their parliament, but it mm -hmm. required them each of the, you know, enough parties that represented a majority of the parliament to agree to that document. And in that document, there was a bit of language saying that the Americans who are in the northern part of Oruzgan had to stay there because they're Americans training the Afghan National Army folks. And it meant that the Dutch wouldn't have to cover the entire province. They could mm -hmm. just cover the parts where the Americans weren't there, which made perfect sense. So we'll go there if the Americans stay. So we, we don't have to worry about that part. Mm -hmm. It's a little easier for us. The second part, a little further down in the document, it said, uh, we will not cooperate with Operation Enduring Freedom, which was the American-led, ad hoc, uh, non-institutionalized effort that was mostly doing counterterrorism, but also doing Afghan National Army training. Mm -hmm. And those Americans in the northern part of Erzgan were not under the Inter International Security Assistance Force chain of command, not under the NATO chain of command, but the, under the American-led OEF chain of command. So on the one hand, you have a, a document saying, we want those guys to stay. On the other hand, we don't want to talk to them. And if you're in the same battle space as the military puts it, you really need to talk to everybody who's there, who's on your side, so you don't end up shooting at them. Mm 
And this process is called deconfliction in the, in the best military jargon. So how do you deconflict? Well, you talk to the, the other side, to the other, to the Americans there and saying, we're going in this direction. Don't shoot at us tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, that is that cooperation that you're not supposed to be doing. Well, how about if you say, we're going this way tomorrow. We're pushing the adversary towards you. Mm-hmm. You might want to be there to receive them. <laughs> right, right, right. Is that deconfliction or is that cooperation? And so what, what somebody decides in, in, in uh, the parliament in The Hague, how does that really apply on the battlefield? Right. Um, and you describe this as a principal agent problem, which is exactly how you described in words just not saying principal agent problem just now, right? Is that yeah. it's so hard for you know what's going on in these governments to actually know and manage this stuff on the ground with people mm-hmm. who are so close to it and have so much more local knowledge. That's right. And there are different ways to handle that. So, you know, if you have, you know, it's not just a matter of creating the rules. You got to figure out if they're, they're going to be obeyed. Mm -hmm. And what was striking about the Dutch case is on the one hand, they had to call home for every significant operation. Uh, anytime there was a possibility of, of encountering the adversary, they had to call home. Anytime they were planning on encountering the the adversary, that phone call had to include the chief of the defense, the, the, the highest ranking member of the Dutch military. And so that, you know, that would obviously uh, weaken the enthusiasm that any officer has. Oh, I got to get on the phone and justify this mission tomorrow with mm-hmm. with my ultimate boss. On the other hand, so they had really tight this this tight leash process. On the other hand, I had lots of stories from Dutch officers who violated whatever restrictions they had. And there was really no oversight and there was no punishment. Mm-hmm. for them. So you had uh, – Dutch police trainer wandering all over Afghanistan. He was only supposed to be in Oregon, but he was had to go. To, he wanted to go to other places to see how it was being done elsewhere. And he just did it, and there were no consequences. And right. so, one of the striking things about the Dutch case is there, you know, the process that they had didn't have any consequences, or at least didn't seem to have any consequences. The fo- folks I talked, mm-hmm. uh, and that was really really striking. So, you know, the, the the one of the puzzles for our book is that it, there's not just one way to control. There's not just one means. To control your military, there's, as I said, these four different ways, and they should interact with each other. They should be designed so that way your oversight uh, protects your, you know, make sure that the whatever discretion you give is is not, you know, you don't go over your bounds, right. and that the incentives, there's penalties or rewards depending on whether you stay within your bounds or not. But what the book is really about in some ways is how there's a systematic difference between which tools countries use. And we tended to find that country, coalition governments tended to rely more heavily on shaping discretion. And those countries where there's a single uh, chain of command, there's a single um, decision maker, a right. president or a prime minister that doesn't have to bargain with other parties. Right. They tended to focus more on the incentives, on the agent selection. And so there was a systematic difference about which tools, which democracy use based on their own political structures. And so that's the argument that we're trying – that's the theoretical argument that we're trying to make that would make all the stuff more predictable for the next round because those institutions are going to be around the next time. Right. Uh, and so we can guess which countries are going to be more flexible about discretion but might be more insistent on playing around with their who, – who's running their operation or how to design the right set of incentives for their uh, their commanders. Right. I mean I can also – and uh, you know, I think you guys get into this a little bit, but I can also imagine all a, a variety of different permutations how this would play out in the civil-military relations literature too, right, in terms of, you know, sort of the, 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 um, the, the relationships of oversight and agent selection, which is, especially agent selection can be understood as violating some principles of um, – some principles of civil military relations, depending on how you evaluate them, you know, perhaps all supporting others. Um, I want to. So you guys make a distinction between um, states which tend to and leaders who tend to have sort of an outcome-oriented view versus mm-hmm. those who have more of a behavior-oriented view. And right, the outcome-oriented view is, you know, more or less, you know, is this mission going to be successful? And the behavior is, how are my troops going to be behaving while they're there? Um, could you talk about that just for a, a little bit? Because I do have a couple questions. Yeah, I think I think this is uh, the stuff that's a little bit less clear uh, for two reasons. One is there is just not as much of a, a literature on it that we can hang our hat on. There was a key, a couple key articles in the principal agent literature about mm-hmm. delegation contracts, and when you delegate, whenever you hire someone and you employ them, how much do you focus on what they're doing? Versus how they're doing it. How much are they reaching their outcomes or are they more concerned about them getting you into trouble? Mm-hmm. 
Um, and the reason why this is uncomfortable for us is because the way it works out in the book is this is a way for us to think about individuals. Mm -hmm. And we as thoroughly trained social scientists, at a, you know, both of us, Dave and I went to UC San Diego, so it was all about institutions and nothing about individuals. Mm -hmm. So it was a little harder for us. It's harder to code whether someone is a behavior-oriented person or, uh, or, or an outcome-oriented person. But we had this theoretical nugget and, and really became clearer to us after having a conversation with a Canadian admiral mm -hmm. because uh, – this Canadian admiral, during the uh, early part of the twenty uh, of, of you know two thousand one, two thousand two, two thousand three, was the chief, the deputy chief of the defense staff. So he was mm -hmm. second in command, and who he was really chief of operations because they really didn't have a chief of operations as a separate command at that point in time. And so when I interviewed him, uh, he uttered a word that nobody else had uttered when I was talking to Canadian commanders before that time, and that was the word was Somalia. Mm -hmm. Right. And what other folks may not realize is that Somalia was more traumatic for the Canadians than for the Americans. Yes, the Americans had Black Hawk Down, uh, which would cause more dam or more death to Americans than what the, Can the Canadians didn't lose any lives. Oh, and to and to Somalis, not incidentally, but yeah, and and and, and killed lots of Somalis, right? right? Exactly. But what happened in, for Canada was there was an event where uh, some Somal there had been a history of Somalis creeping into the Canadian camp to try to steal stuff. And so this one unit, this one, the Canadian Airborne Regiment, captured a couple of these Somalis and beat one of them to death. And the series of reactions to this, which included some cover-ups and, and mm -hmm. some investigations, led to years of ramifications where multiple chiefs of defense staff were fired, ministers of defense lost their job. And so when I was talking to this admiral, this vice admiral, he uttered the word Somalia because he wanted, he was basically expressing that when they were sending the missions to Afghanistan, they were most worried about mission failure. Mm -hmm. They were most concerned that, about their troops doing something that would cause so much uh, trauma to the Canadian public that the Canadian politicians would have to pull the troops out. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a very, very different attitude than when I was interviewing other folks who were talking more about achieving outcomes. Mm -hmm. And so when you're delegating the kinds of things you care about, the kinds of restrictions you impose, the kind of oversight you engage in. If you're more focused on behavior, you're going to be more focused on how to lessen the risks that something's going to come back on you. Uh, and you're going to be less focused on what is necessary to complete the task. Cause it's not quite ends versus means, but there is a tendency to focus more on whether the means are going to get into trouble versus what do you need to do to accomplish the various ends. Although I know, and this is, this is uh, sort of the question that that uh, that came to me as, as as I was reading this part of the book was, um, you know, for the particular vision of coin that counterinsurgency doctrine that was installed under McChrystal and uh, to a less lesser extent continued under Petraeus, those two are brought together, right, in some important sense, right, where the behavior is part of the attempt to achieve outcomes, right, mm -hmm. because otherwise, because infuriating the Afghan public through blowing up a hundred people out of a fuel truck or something like that mm -hmm. um, is in and of itself, you know, sort of out, you know, outside of the question of whether you also killed a bunch of Taliban is associated with success, right? So those two sort of come together in, a, in a, probably a difficult to suss out way. Yes, and I was lucky enough that my co-author was responsible for the U.S. case, so he was a, he was the one who had to struggle with that uh -huh. um, rather than me. The the case I used more uh, the, that I that where this was important because mm -hmm. again, this distinction matters more for the presidential cases and for the single uh, party cases where you have uh, you know the Britain where you only had for most of the time only one party in power mm -hmm. because the in our book we are <laughs> coalition politics dynamics matter more. Mm -hmm. uh, than than the behavior versus outcomes kind of inclinations, but when you have a single individual making the decisions, we have to figure out what what what's guiding those individuals' decisions. And so we decided it was sort of a past past experience that led to a disposition about focusing on behavior versus outcomes. Mm -hmm. And we saw individuals change. So Rumsfeld at some point cares about outcomes, but then he sees some behavior that he really dislikes, and so he then micromanages to wipe it out. Um, but the case I always focused on. Uh, because I got to go to Paris for this, was to was the realization that you had two politicians in France who are in the exact same part of the political spectrum, uh, Chirac versus Sarkozy. Mm 
but they were very had very different inclinations about whether to focus on minimizing the blowback from Afghanistan or trying to be successful. That Chirac uh, restricted all of the 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 public mm-hmm. unit in Afghanistan. That is that they they, they had a uh, a unit in in Kabul from 2003 to 2007 or so that that was just in Kabul doing peacekeeping and wasn't really set up for war fighting and he refused to let it change over to war fighting and go in any part of the country because he was damned if he was going to let uh, the French help out the United States while the United States is it's you know is, is obsessed with Iraq. Right. Um, so he's very much focused on limiting the behavior and there was actually a special operations uh, group from France hanging out in another part of Afghanistan that were actually fairly for you know fairly forward leaning but since they weren't public they you know a soft team mm-hmm. um you know Chirac let that go uh where Sarkozy comes into power and he immediately agrees to shift some forces to Kapisa which is a very dangerous region of eastern Afghanistan and they paid a price for that because he wanted NATO to be successful in Afghanistan he wanted to support NATO mm-hmm. because he had a larger inclination about you know France within NATO uh, so you have a sw- switch in two individuals, and you see a uh, change overnight in terms of what the Canadians, uh, what are the French doing on the ground. That's interesting uh, too, because I mean, just to sort of hand back, that does suggest. I mean, the, the you know the French have a reputation as a fighting military, at least in these kinds of sorts of contexts, right? And so, and but and and you also talk about the Australians who have this reputation as a fighting military, but they're hamstrung um, mm-hmm. by the by the caveats. But anyway, keep going. Well, I mean, and so the, the interesting thing is, is which individuals were were disposed, mm-hmm. and so we, if we want to move over to the Australian case, uh, which was a really, really interesting case, it wasn't just an excuse to go to Australia, New mm-hmm. Zealand, which I was very thankful for. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, compared to civil military relations, is a great way to do tourism. <laughs> I had a great time doing this research on on the weekends in between interviews, right. but. Um, Australia was very interesting because that was a point where you, the Australia has this reputation as being these tough fighters. You know, the the crocodile hunters, the the diggers from World War One. You know, the, the, that's what you call an Australian soldier a digger because they they dug you know on the beaches of Gallipoli uh, trenches to to deal with the fact that they were put in a really really bad place by the British, just like every other former British colony. Um, and you know, the reputation of World War II was they, they fought, you know, really brutal battles in the, you know, the tracks, mm-hmm. you know, a one person path through the, the, the jungle, uh, what now we know is Indonesia and Papua New Guinea, I guess. Um, just brutal, brutal fighters. And, and they have this reputation for being sluggers and, you know, they fought really hard in Vietnam. And mm-hmm. so they have this reputation. And what was striking about Afghanistan is they were able to carry it through the entire Afghan effort through a very, very careful strategy, which is, they relied entirely on their commandos and their special air for, air service guys, their their special operations forces. Mm-hmm. Even though they had uh, infantry in in town, they had uh, 1,500 troops in 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 Uruzgan. They were working with the Dutch, and 200 guys were doing all the work, mm-hmm. and the other 1,300 guys were doing reconstruction stuff. But they weren't doing patrolling. They weren't doing you know interdiction. They weren't doing any of the real combat stuff. Well, the first time an infantry guy got hurt was, um, I think it was when he, when the Dutch, when the Aussies started doing mentoring. Because when you start placing your troops inside of an Afghan battalion, then then, then the risks go up. And and that 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 dynamic is something we talk about in the book because countries vary quite widely on how willing they were to do that. Right. And also because it went by the uh, wonderful uh, acronym of Omelet. <laughs> I love that. Uh, which was. Uh, useful for presentations. Right, we need uh, more omelets in the south, right? We need more omelets in Afghanistan was the phrase. Uh, and then when I went to a French briefing, it turns out that that acronym in French is Elmo. <laughs> uh, so uh, much humor from this. But it was also good because every country was sort of more asked to do it, mm-hmm. and then you could you could see what countries were willing to do. Were they willing to do it? And the key variation was: were you willing to have your mentors follow? the battalion they were mentoring outside of the area that they were, they started in. So Mm -hmm. the Germans had mentors in the Afghan battalions in the North, but the Afghan battalions didn't respect these lines drawn by NATO that, you know, they were commanded by the the government of Afghanistan. So if they had to move South, they moved South. The question then would be, would the mentors move South? And uh, the answer is for the Germans, no, they wouldn't leave regional command North Uh, for the French It required a phone call. And that was consequential because there was one time where the French, the, the battalion the French were mentoring had to move quickly, and it took 24 hours to get a phone call to Sarkozy. Mm-hmm. Uh, what was he doing time, in those 24 hours? 
Well, this is the reality is that we now know that we can do this kind of Skype thing instantaneously, but right. to get a decision takes time. Right. And 24 hours is actually pretty agile because, again, if you have to go all the way to the top, and in France that top meant going to the president, you now that takes time. You may have to wake him up. You may have to brief him. Uh, it takes, you know, that, you know, that process of phone call, phone call, phone call until you finally, you know, have the president on the line. Uh, and by the time that process happened, the, the Afghan battalion had gone to Kandahar. It was reacting to, to the first prison break there. And the Canadian commander there found some U.S. Marines and put them to be mentors for that Afghan battalion. But when they went to battle, they broke because they didn't trust their mentors. Right. 24 hours later, the French show up. They're plugged back into their old uh, Afghan battalion. They go into battle. They do fine. And so that illustrates the importance of trust and relationships uh, in this process and how this ca- how this phone call process gets in the way. Yeah, it's very, it was very interesting reading. I want to mention this and then I want to ask two other questions and then we have something else to before we want to go. But um, I... I one of the parts of World War II that fascinates me is the early Japanese conquest of the Dutch East Indies, right, in which you have a, what is a, basically an ad hoc coalition thrown together of Americans, British, Australians, and Dutch, who just engage in a series of disastrous battles against the Japanese, right, and sort of this, these classics of coalition warfare, of problematic coalitions. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in this case, there's things where, you know, they, the, the captains on the ships just don't even speak the same language. So you have a Dutch commander who can't communicate with his American sailors, and they also have all sorts of caveats, and they have different strategic... Um, but the communications aspects really kind of come through as well, yeah. right? You know, the, and how far we are now from the level of communication that we were then where you can literally pick up a phone on a ship and talk to the president or something along those lines. So, Well, it's funny because I, I did, I just got in the habit of reading some books about the Pacific war, mm-hmm. uh, world war two. And there's a great quote in there about, you know, in 1942, there was, you know, in, in the Pacific, there was some quote about um, how there's no way the Americans will let anybody else boss them around. Right. And I was also reading uh, last year, um, Atkinson has a series of books on, on the European war from, from uh, one of the first book is on the Africa campaign. The second book is on the Italian campaign. Her book is on the European is on France and, 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 uh, and so forth. And you forget just how much conflict there was between the British and the Americans, how much contempt they had, right. uh, mm-hmm. that make all the stuff in, in, that's gone in Afghanistan. There's a lot of jokes about, you know, uh, and, and friction, but it compares it not at all to, you know, the fear that, you know, if you you as an American hand over any units to the British, they're going to get you killed for nothing. Or that the Americans were just complete amateurs in warfare and the British couldn't possibly trust them to do anything. Right. So, I mean, when we talk about alliances versus coalitions, we forget that NATO has a lot of added value. That any coalition or any multilateral military operation, countries are going to remain sovereign, which means that they're going to impose their national control and they're going to have these frictions. And they're going to have these caveats. They're going to have these problems that we identify in a book. We talk about NATO because that was the case that we're interested in. Uh, But it was it's true for you know any multilateral military operation. What NATO provides is decades, generations of training, of coordination, not just the technical and operability of whether planes can fly together, but whether the people can work together. Um, And so you know one of the real questions about how to how to refuel planes in the skies over Libya, because we're, we're constantly having planes get refueled, you know, one of the things we don't notice is that there were no plane crashes in that process, right? Refueling is right. a pretty difficult kind of thing. And there were no plane crashes, which suggests, you know, these guys are really good at it, and you get really good at it by practicing with each other. And, and so you had American and Canadian planes refueling the, the planes from like 20, 15 other countries. Uh, and for most of them, they had, you know, these decades of practice. Now, there are a couple countries that, you know, they didn't, like their uh, Qatar and, I guess, um, I want to say Jordan, maybe somebody else. Mm -hmm. There are a few other, you know, Middle East countries that that don't have that habit, but, you know, it mattered. And that language mattered when I was, I happened to bump into an American uh, pilot who had been doing that uh, mission. And he said the real variation was not so much restriction, you know, the restrictions for his refueling stuff. What mattered was how well the pilots of, of the planes that were being refueled spoke English. Right, right, right. Because, you know, left, right, if you can say that quickly, you know, it's easier than having to translate in your head, gauche, adroit, you know, that, that's really hard. So they had a little harder time doing it with the French than with some other countries because, you know, the Danes are all fluent in English, the Norwegians are all fluent in English. So it was seamless with, with you know, the, the, the Scandinavian countries, mm-hmm. uh, a little bit less seamless with the, the French. But again, still, 
you know, those planes are built to, to interact and, uh, but then, a, then a Romanian MIG shows up or something like that. And it's just really, you know. well, that would have been interesting. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, but the thing is, they, you know, there are countries that, you know, East European countries that showed up, but they, they now have American kit. So it wouldn't have been a problem. It was like, where are the poles where they're at 16s? Like, they, they could do this kind of thing. So, I mean, one of the real added values of NATO is all that habit, all that, all that, that years of experience. And so when the Americans, French and British try to do it, you know, have three separate chains of command running the Libyan operation at first, they found it really, really hard. And so the Americans are like, we need to have NATO, a NATO command headquarters do this because this is what they do. They commit, they are very good at controlling many different planes from many different countries all at the same time. And so the Americans insist on it. The French were a little bit less enthused. Um, I mean, if I, if I could, if I could, if I could invent a new subtitle, would, would, would you say it's accurate, right? NATO, the worst kind of coalition fighting except for all the other kinds of coalition fighting? Yes, I, I've taken uh, to call myself a Churchillian. <laughs> Churchill, <laughs> Churchill. And there are two quotes that start the book, and I'll, I want to get them right. Um, the first is by Napoleon: "I'd rather fight a coalition than be part of one." But he ended up losing some big battles. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then Winston Churchill: "There's at least one thing worse than fighting with allies, and that is to fight without them." And so I've taken to, to, to using the phrase that the the worst form, the NATO is the worst form of multilateral operations or most for, worst form of coalition warfare, except for all the others. Uh, I think NATO does a, the, the the realization at the end of the book was, oh crap, I've written a really with my co-author a really negative book about NATO. Uh, but the realization is that NATO does pretty well. I mean, right. One of the big questions is, would it have been better had the U.S. done everything by itself? And the answer is, is it couldn't. Right, it's an irrelevant US, question, right? I mean, it, it, yeah, especially with the, in, in context of Iraq, right? Well, it was, you know, it was fighting two wars at once, and, it, you know, in the good old days, the United States had thought it could do that kind of thing, but in the 21st century, it can't. And so maybe some units in Afghanistan weren't as effective as, as Americans would have liked. Some were probably more effective than the Americans, uh, but they were certainly more effective than having no Ameri- having no, nobody there. Mm-hmm. So we criticized the Germans a lot. But they were doing a job in northern Afghanistan that, that needed to be done. And maybe they weren't doing that great well, but it meant that other folks could be in the south and the east doing the really hard work. Uh, so it might have been a politically damaging distribution of effort, but it was a logical one, given that the Germans were less able to do stuff in the north or the Italians were less able to do stuff in the west. Mm-hmm. But they didn't need to do as much stuff as what the British, the Americans, the Danes, the Australians, the Dutch, and, where, and the Romanians, whoever else was in the east and the south. All right, so last question on the book, and then we'll use this to segue to our next topic, which is going to be about blogging and political science, and which frankly, and I guess we'll talk about it then, is a debate I thought we had finished in 2005, but it just reared its, <laughs> it reared its ugly head in, uh, last week. But um, when you were writing this, when you and your partner were writing this, this, I mean, this is very much a political science book, right? I mean, this is sort of classic political science book. Did you ever sort of, when you were going through this, think to yourself, like, how much of a political science book, do we want this to be? Like, how much do we want to focus on these models and these traditional political science yeah. models and sort of revisit the model at the beginning of every chapter, which is a very political science way of doing things? And how much do we want to speak to a different audience, right? Was this ever a consideration for you? It was in our heads the entire time. Um, when we first started on the book, we weren't sure we wanted it to go to an academic press or we wanted to send it to somebody like Brookings. Right. Um, because we knew that we were dealing with something that was very, very policy relevant that my co-author Dave Arswell worked the National War College, so he kind of has to be able to speak mm-hmm. policy relevance since that's his, you know, his day job. Uh, in the course of this book, I moved from Montreal to Ottawa to to a policy school, so I, I could actually have more policy-oriented conversations. Mm-hmm. Um, and the entire, the most of the research involved me talking to people in the policy world in a bunch of different countries, and it was really exciting, really interesting. And as a result, I ended up in this second half of the project having lots of conversations where I was then disseminating my take to the policy world. And in fact, mm-hmm. uh, the talks I'm giving over the next couple of months are primarily going to be aimed at the policy community. So there's theory in there. And I, I've been on Twitter right. telling people, if you don't like theory, you know, skip half a chapter two. Right. And I don't want to overstate, right? Yeah. I mean, this is not a political science book in the sense of, you know, and here are our findings, and then 43 different regressions with variables taken out. Right, it's not that, right, but it is yeah, a it, qualitative it, 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 political science book. It, it, well, not only is it qualitative, but uh, I, the book is eminently readable, even if you skim 
you know, there's there's key hunks. Uh, uh, you know, there, there's some there's some theory and there's some mm-hmm. you know game trees essentially right. more or less or some some figures mm-hmm. in chapter three that you know you can skip or not skip. But the larger most of the book is really case studies of really interesting stuff, telling people about the patterns that each country behaved differently, and we we talk about what they did, and then we try to tie it to the political dynamics of each country. Um. And what I found is if I, I've had the chance to uh, have roundtables in the Canadian Department of Foreign Affairs and the Canadian Department of, De- Department of National Defense. I gave an early version of this talk at the U.S. Army War College uh, and in other you know, various think tanks where they don't really mm-hmm. care about theory uh, in a bunch of different countries. And there's a real strong interest in this stuff because they've experienced these things. They didn't know why they existed. Mm-hmm. And so I was on Midrats last week. Uh, which is a an internet radio program hosted by a couple of ex, uh, I think sailors. Yeah. Um, and one of them shout had, out. It's a good program. It's a good program. I mean, yeah, I mean, Midrats. It's a really it, good yeah. program, and they ask really good questions. Mm-hmm. Unlike yours, <laughs> yours, yours were also very good questions. Um, but they ask really good questions about how do you think about this stuff and how does it apply. And uh, what was striking about it is they, one of the guys was like, you know, I went into NATO uh, as part of my rotation. I was doing Kosovo stuff. And I would really like to have had your book because it made sense of things. And if you read Wesley Clark's uh, memoir about that war, if you read other takes about these things. In fact, I, I have that it, right here. I, I don't you, even know why. But. Yeah, and we feature a story about Wesley Clark in the very first chapter because it sort of sets up the whole rest of the book because he engages in a, an argument with the British over whether to use the British to you know confront the Russians in, in Kosovo. And... Uh, um, and so, you know, that guy, that guy was like a lot of the folks we've talked to, which is, oh, wow, you're explaining the stuff that we've encountered. Right. Um, one of the striking experiences was, was Dave, my co-author, had, had, in his position at the National War College, had interacted with Admiral Stravitas, who had, was Supreme Allied Commander of Europe. And so Stravitas got a copy of the book before it was published. He had a PDF. And his reaction was, can I share this with my command staff? Mm-hmm. And I was like, we were like, sure, yes, absolutely. <laughs> How can I say no? How can I say yeah? No? And and so we now have a blurb in the back of the book from Sakir, and you know he's now he's now the dean at Tufts Policy School. Right, right, right. Um, yeah. And so you know our book was definitely we we try to shoot the middle of having it be both academic enough so that we have a theory that we can test, and that that we said we were generalized about something that isn't just NATO specific, but also a book that 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 was still able to be. Uh, interesting to folks beyond the academic debates about this thing because the problem with all almost all the academic work on, on alliances is they ask the question of why do they happen mm-hmm. and why do they endure but not what happens once the firing starts right well, I mean, I should say for for uh, our, our watchers, I, I consumed this book in about three days with four year olds howling in my ear the entire <laughs> time, so um, it's certainly readable. Um, so segueing from that to this other situation, um, but it's staying within political science. Um, so political science is our is our um, is our connective tissue here. Um, so last, I don't remember if it was last week or the week before. It was last week. It's been a very fast week. It has been a very fast week. So, um, and. You'll have to correct me when I get parts of the story wrong here, but the uh, International Studies Association uh, put forward at least a proposed um, a proposed set of rules that would um, prohibit um, editors of ISA journals from also blogging at the same time while they're editors of ISA journals. Um, and it was just a proposal, but it, it was out there. Is that that's how, how I'm remembering it? Yes, uh, that's, that's pretty much it. Uh, mm-hmm. That the it wasn't the entire ISA. It was the and ISA is the International Studies Association. Yeah, the International Studies Association, which is a you know group of you know several thousand international affairs scholars mm-hmm. throughout the world. It's uh, North American centered, but there's plenty of folks from from Europe and Asia and Africa mm-hmm. uh, involved. And what happened was uh, the executive committee of the ISA proposed this policy. Uh, to the governing council. The governing council consists of the executive committee and a bunch of other folks who are, for some reason, empowered to be uh, at the table mm-hmm. at the day-long meeting that that's, that that kicks off the International Studies Association meeting. So, at the end of March in Toronto this year, there is the annual meeting that moves from place to place. Mm-hmm. Traditionally, it's gone from cold place to cold place to hot right. place to cold places. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's in Toronto this year. 
And this was this, this was on the agenda. This is one item of many. So this wasn't the only thing. Uh, and the proposal was really strange because it wasn't just a you know it it had two pieces of it. The first piece was was that it's it's the editorial staff. So it's you know these days all these journals are edited by five, six, seven, eight people. Mm -hmm. So it's basically saying that everybody gets involved in any one of these teams cannot be blogging in any kind of way. But the language attached to it suggested that. You know, because we believe in professionalism, our editors can't blog. And that's not a direct quote, but that's almost a direct quote. Mm -hmm. And so it was conflating blogging with being unprofessional. And so it was doing two things. It was basically saying that the folks who want to become editors of these journals have to sacrifice something quite significant. Mm -hmm. But it was also the, you know, if it had been passed, and it still could be passed. I mean, it's still right. up in the air. Uh, in the course of last week's, week's blogger well, blogging battle, um, the president finally relented and, and agreed to send it to committee. So it could come out of committee in some form, but I, I, I don't think it will. Um, is it sent a really bad message to the entire National Studies Association that the people who are in power in the association think that blogging is inherently unprofessional? Right. And and this was sort of, um, you know, I mean, what what I had thought, and I think what a lot of other bloggers had thought, and, and of course foreign or not foreign things, but blogging hits people, like most of the political scientists you see on this show are people who are connected in blogging some way, right? You, me, um, Dan Dresner with the I don't know how to deal with the name of his new show, Dresbert, um, but, uh, you know, whatever, guys. Um, <laughs> whoever came up with that, well, that's certainly a name. Um, but most of like Charlie Carpenter has been on here before. Dan Nexon has been on here before. Um, it seems like this was a fight that had been won, right? I mean, this was a fight, right? The, this 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 question of is blogging inherently unprofessional, and a different way of phrasing that is blogging to be treated as something which is going to be inherently destructive to your professional your career as a professional political scientist, right? Yeah. Hopefully, we answered that question in like two thousand six, right? You know, we we. This is something, this is a battle we fought and we have moved on from. To, mm -hmm. Now we can deal with different questions like, well, how do we evaluate blogging in context of a political science career? How do we treat whatever its positive aspects may be, you know, mm -hmm. as a researcher, as a service, right? These are genuine, legitimate, interesting questions. But what this did was it dragged, it said, we're going to, and ISA is usually regarded as, you know, less stick in the mud than APSA, right? But, and it like, dragged us back to this fight that we thought was completely finished a long time ago. And what's funny is that uh, the program chair for this year's ISA asked me last spring to organize a panel on Twitter to help inform the ISA members about what Twitter is good for, uh, why should pe why should or why do people tweet, what's, what, you know, what value does it have. So I've organized a panel with uh, some of the usual suspects and some not usual suspects. But you know, one one thing that people have called Twitter is microblogging, right? And so one of the problems with this entire policy was. Why is blogging different from any other outreach? Why is it different from t uh, Twitter? Why is it different from podcasting? Why is it different from Facebook? Why is it different from being on TV, radio, or being interviewed in the newspapers or writing an op-ed column? Right. Because you know, the, the, there's a sense that blogging creates these really, really noisy conversations. Well, I mean, it's funny because if you do any TV, radio, or newspaper stuff these days, immediately what that will happen is they'll t the whoever you're doing it with will take that and put it on that place's website. Right. Right. So, uh, you know, you can find me on, uh, you know, my TV stuff hits in Canada, go on the CTV or CBC website or whatever. Uh, I'm sure that's the case for all the American stuff mm -hmm. uh, and around the world. And, you know, you do radio, they'll put up the radio hit. And so what happens after that is there will be a comment thread. And that comment thread is ugly most of the time. Uh, hilariously ugly. It's really fantastic. It's you know, it's outstanding. Yeah. And so when I have you know, I, one of the places I blog at is called Canadian International Council, and they have this thing called Open Canada, which is uh, an effort to have sort of a foreign policy dot com uh, in the north. And so I post a column there every week, and some of those columns get reposted through a relationship with the Globe and Mail, which is one of Canada's big newspapers. It's sort of the New York Times of Canada. And when those things happen, then I look at the, you know, I'll occasionally look at the comment threads, and it's just amazing. And so the Internet is a boisterous place. We know this. Um, but we need to be able to separate out the person, you know, people in, 
who write the stuff, but the people who come, come into the stuff. Mm-hmm. To be fair to the ISA, this wasn't a reaction to events last August. It was clearly a, a reaction to events last August, where at Duck of Minerva, one person wrote a particularly controversial a post that mm-hmm. seemed to be quite sexist. Uh, and uh, Dan Nexon, who was the incoming editor of ISQ, founded the Duck of Minerva. Mm-hmm. And so people were asking and demanding Dan to stand up and condemn the post. And Dan felt he couldn't because the idea of the Duck of Minerva was that each person was an independent mm-hmm. contributor and there was no editing going on, mm-hmm. that, that no individual who was in the Duck had a responsibility for what other people in the Duck wrote. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there was a concern that you know this could happen again where somebody was editing a journal and the, the, either they would write something in a blog or somebody else would write something in a collective blog and and would splash back on the ISA. Well, it turns out, really, the worst thing for the ISA's reputation was not an editor blogging something. It was about the ISA restricting bloggers from blogging because they got a lot more crap this week and last right. week. Uh, this thing went viral in a way that I did not anticipate. I got, edit, I got interviewed by The Guardian uh, about this, and anybody who cares about academic freedom po- reposted something from these discussions. You had a post... Uh, people at Monkey Cage had a post. Right. Uh, there are multiple people at Duck and Minerva. There, and there's all kinds of posts. I keep on getting notified of other posts. Um, and yeah, this was a, and one of the things I said was I, you know, I would have expected this 10 years ago, but not now because there are other elements of the ISA, including the program chair, who are trying to encourage people to engage in this kind of discourse. Right. We, we have a blogger reception at ISA. We've had panels on blogging at ISA. I mean, I remember. You weren't at this one, but I sat on a blog uh, panel with uh, Steve Walt and Kindred Weinkoff and uh, Dresner and Charlie Carpenter years ago at ISA, right? And, you know, it seems like this has all been internalized now. And the thing is, is that like any big group, uh, not everybody is on the same message, right? So you have people who – it was clear when that policy was written at that executive committee, there was nobody in the room that blogged. Mm-hmm. There was nobody had any Web 2.0 experience. Which is shocking. Were, I get I, I, that's so – I mean, there's no other way to think about it because there's right. no way you could have written that policy without thinking about some of this stuff. Like, right. wow, if we tell bloggers not to blog, what will they do? Well, they're probably going to blog about it. <laughs> and, you know, what about Twitter? And what about, you know, how, how does it, you know, how is blogging distinct from other media? And this is exactly the same time where there's a lot of pressure on academia to be more open, more transparent. Mm-hmm. And I've been uh, kind of a skeptic about the open access movement, the idea that, we should have our journal. I mean, I, I'm okay with, I, I would like to have no firewalls between mm-hmm. academic journals and the public. But the reality is, is that most of the public is not going to be reading academic journals because they're written in jargon. And that's mm-hmm. fine because that's our shorthand for talking to each other. And we have, you know, we have methodology sections of our, our arguments and we have lit reviews and a lot of mm-hmm. the stuff is p- things people don't read. They just want to get the punchline. And the joy of blogging is it allows us to take what we know from our deep reading of all this literature or you know, and take that and communicate mm-hmm. that in English or in right. Spanish, whatever your native language is, what o- whatever audience you're trying to reach, right. you can convert that really weird language we have and communicate it. And that is where the movement is. That's where that's where the pressure is. I have on um, a grant application that's currently under review. Uh oh. Um, you know, they they asked for a, a knowledge dissemination plan. One of the documents in this grant application is how do you disseminate your knowledge? Right. That's common. And they that's want common. and they want it more than just I'm going to publish in academic journals. They want it. They want it as a public government as the Canadian government wants us to to communicate beyond ourselves. And the answer I gave in that grant was here's all my experience blogging. Here's my experience doing the stuff. You know, doing TV, radio. Uh, newspaper art stuff and blogging and Twitter. And this is how I get my message out. And I know that I have this audience because I end up having conversations with either online or in person with people who work in Ottawa, people who work in DC, people who work in national capitals who are in the public sphere. This is how we do it. Right. And we're not gonna be able to do it just by saying, okay, we're to blow down this barrier and you guys can read our really strange stuff we write. Right, right, and and I mean, really, any 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 uh, book proposal you put together these days has to include something about how you. I mean, it's always included a marketing section, but it also has to include some sort of way of disseminating. I mean, one thing I liked about, like, I bought the Kindle edition of your book. Um, okay. So sorry if you get fewer royalties. Uh, that, that's that's okay. I was I was curious as to how it looks. 
<laughs> well, it looks fantastic, and what's great about it is the notes section has active hyperlinks. Oh, so, that's really? Yeah, so there are active hyperlinks there, so for a lot of, you know, it's not, it's not as if, like, do we have every source here then connecting to the Amazon page of the book we're citing or something like that. No, but when it, we put in hyperlinks, they, they actually are hyper. Great. Yeah, yeah, no, and so it's, that's, that's extremely productive in terms of sort of being able to engage with the evidence, and is, you know, part and parcel of this broader, um, this broader effort to, uh, to to make everything a little bit more accessible that, that Web 2.0 has really offered us, right? Um, and so it's been interesting. Well, now maybe you can use this as another like 15 minute, uh, 15 or 10 or 15 minute soundbite as to as to why um, the what the problems with this approach. So yeah, no. Or I, maybe this will get you blackballed from being an editor in the future. Then that's also a possibility. You know, uh, it was funny because the the Guardian person asked me, well, if you have to choose between being an editor and a blogger, which one will you choose? And it's like, do I want to do the thing that you know? Obviously, blogging creates a lot more work for myself, but it's work that I chosen you know right. whereas editing is a lot of work mm -hmm. if i have to choose it's an easy choice yeah okay. um and I, I do think that by speaking out last week i'm not gonna have to make that choice anytime <laughs> soon um right. but uh um you know it's it, for me it's an easy choice uh it's just that as we do more of this stuff in our teaching and our research and our service mm -hmm. you're asking people to give up a hunk of their professional life in order to do something that's really onerous right. Because, you know, editors, you know, only have to, you only accept 10 or 15 or 20% of the stuff they, they get. So that means that 80% of the people are pissed off at them. Right. And, it's, and the people who, who get published usually aren't that thankful to the editors. They think, well, my stuff is so smart, it deserved to get into this journal. So it really is a thankless task. Uh, and uh, and uh, to make it harder for them by, you know, cutting off a key resource for them is, is, right. is silly. So uh, it was, I'm glad to see that. There was such rapid mobilization uh, within the ISA and outside of it that made uh, the president, you know, turn back the proposal very pretty quickly. I mean, it only took about three days. All right. Well, I think that's what we have for today, and we've actually uh, run a little bit longer than most of the blogging has, but I think it's been good. So, um, for our viewers, thank you very much, Steve. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you for having me.